23C, I've actually broken up into two files um, just because when I when I upload these beasts, if they're smaller, they upload a little bit faster. Uh, it's still a, a nightmare, but um, just just be aware that there's a part C1 and a part C2, just like there was a part A1 and a part A2. We're talking about the small intestine in, in the start of this file, and I'm on slide two. Digestion uh, continues in the small intestine. It started in the mouth. And um, really, all of our molecules start breaking down in the mouth, but the mouth specializes in carbohydrates, whereas the stomach specializes in proteins, and the small intestine, especially the duodenum, specializes in lipid digestion. Anything that hasn't been broken down to its uh, monomer components is going to be sort of finalized in the small intestine. So if proteins are not broken down yet into amino acids, then the small intestine is going to get that done. If carbohydrates aren't broken down into glucose, galactose, or fructose, then the small intestine is going to get that done. So it's sort of the finalizer and also the chief lipid digester. Uh, almost all of our absorption occurs across the wall of the small intestine with a, a few exceptions. And one of those exceptions we've already encountered is, is the stomach does um, participate in absorption of things like alcohol. Uh, and then we'll also find that there are a few things that are that are absorbed across the wall of the large intestine, but the the vast majority of absorption occurs in the small intestine. And in class, I'll show you about how long the small intestine is. Um, just just so you don't freak out about this, um, this note. Oops, come on, pencil. There we go. Um, this note just means when we're alive. Okay. Uh, two to four meters, and of that, uh, the duodenum is, <coughs> excuse me, about 25 centimeters long, uh, about 10 inches long, and um, the rest is roughly half jejunum and half ileum. As you hopefully know, the duodenum is retroperitoneal, and it sort of hugs the, the head of the pancreas, whereas the jejunum and ileum are intraperitoneal, and uh, duodenum connects to jejunum, jejunum connects to ileum, ileum connects to large intestine, whereas duodenum, of course, it uh, connects to the stomach. And the duodenum, because it's sort of got the first access to foodstuffs that are coming from the stomach, it's going to add quite a bit to chyme. It's uh, sort of a, um, a nice little introductory uh, portion w where, <coughs> excuse me, bile is added to chyme. Uh, pancreatic juice is added to chyme, and the duodenum is also um, releasing digestive enzymes across microvilli, and those enzymes are often referred to as brush, border, enzymes. And brush border enzymes are produced all along the small intestine. But of course, it's in the duodenum that chyme is first exposed to them. Okay. The jejunum isn't connected to any other organ. It's just connected to duodenum and ileum. So it's kind of like a bridge. 
and um, it's where uh, a, a good deal of our absorption is occurring. Uh, absorption is is uh, the specialty of the jejunum. Most of our nutrient monomers are going to be absorbed across the wall of the jejunum, whereas the ileum uh, specializes in 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 certain things that are especially difficult to reabsorb or um, things that we need even more time to digest. So we want to wait all the way until we're in the end of the small intestine or uh, things that we want to uh, reabsorb at the last sort of minute. And, and I'll come back to all of that. The ileum, of course, does connect to another organ. It connects to the large intestine. And where it connects to the large intestine is uh, a sphincter called the ileocecal valve. We talked about it briefly in, in person on, on uh, Thursday of last week. Uh, recall that the small intestine features circular folds, villi, microvilli, and now we also know it's very long, okay? All four of these um, uh, properties really just yield so much surface area for absorption, yes, but also to prolong the digestive processes um, because going through a water slide without bumps is fast and going through a water slide with bumps it is slow. Okay. What's really going to probably drive that home for you is that the surface area offered by our skin is greatly, greatly eclipsed by the surface area offered by our alveoli, which is in turn eclipsed by the surface area offered by our small intestine. So, wow, that's a lot of surface area. I'm going to move on to slide three. Actually, I'm going to interrupt. So, um, I obviously will not be showing you <laughs> in class um, how long the small intestine may be. So, but I can describe it to you. Um, if a small intestine is four meters long, then what I do in the classroom is I grab four single meter sticks and I lay them out end to end, okay? And whether you took 241 and your lab room was S219 or you took 241 and your lab room was S220 um, or um, you took 160 and your lab room was maybe S214 or S216. All of those lab benches, those dark, dark lab benches where you sit um, and, and, and four chairs can occupy, okay? I, I lay those four meter sticks out end to end across just one of those four seater lab benches, okay? End to end. And students quickly notice, oh, they don't actually fit. In other words, there's some overhang. And I adjust the meter sticks just so in order to force the overhang to be about 10 inches. And that overhang represents, therefore, the duodenum. Okay? But the rest of that distance is divided roughly in half for the jejunum and roughly in half for the ileum. So hopefully just me describing it gives you a little bit of visual support. Sorry for interrupting. We actually have already already looked at circular folds, villi and microvilli together. Circular folds we can see with our naked eye. Here's a little note to remind us about prolonging digestive processes, digestion and absorption. Same thing here, okay. Villi 
I can't see with my naked eye. I need a compound light microscope, which of course we have access to. So we will be looking at the small intestine uh, and specifically villi at some point, um, possibly this week, possibly next week, we'll see, but definitely before the practicum. Villi are very finger-like, all right? Uh, recall that they have a lacteal at their core. They also have a, a capillary bed at their core. So that's sort of like the filling of the Twinkie. And uh, also recall that villi are, are not all equal in, hot, in height or, or length or whatever you want to call that. Microvilli are not viewable through a compound light microscope. They're just too small. I would need an electron microscope to see those guys. And if we look at the simple columnar epithelium that's lining the small intestine, Simple columnar looks a heck of a lot like book spines or um, bricks on end. If this is what's often called the basolateral surface, not in contact with the lumen, and this is the apical surface, which is in contact with lumen. Then in the small intestine, these simple columnar epithelia, their apical surface is folded. And it's those folds that we're referring to when we talk about microvilli. Okay, often, uh, microvilli are referred to as brush border, okay? So any enzymes that these simple columnar cells are secreting, uh, they're secreting across the surface area offered by microvilli, and so those enzymes are called brush border enzymes. Brush border enzymes specialize in the, the sort of finalization of carbohydrate and protein digestion, uh, but we'll fine tune that later in the, in the file. Moving on to slide four. Here we can, we can uh, readily see circular folds. These are circular folds, okay? We can also see villi. These are villi, okay? But at this scale, we can't see microvilli. The uh, illustrator has uh, made an effort to show circular muscle as well as longitudinal muscle, which we would expect in muscularis externa. Moving on to slide five. Now that we're zoomed quite a bit in, we can see villi. Um, despite the, the illustration, um, Remember that, that villi are not typically all equal in height, okay? And if we zoom way in on a villus and we look at the apical, whereas this is basolateral, surface of the simple columnar cells that are establishing, oops, that is misspelled simple, which is kind of funny. It's a simple word. <laughs> we look 
look at their apical surface, then we can see, oh yeah, oh yeah, they're equipped with microvilli. These guys that are, that are interrupting our goblet cells, okay? And then this, this pit here, this pit here sort of helps to extend the valley between adjacent villi. And that valley is called an intestinal crypt. And this is where a lot of the specialized cells of the small intestine are housed. <coughs> Excuse me. Whereas once we're once we're up here in, in the villus, most of, of what we're of what we're looking at are gonna be goblet cells. And um, the sort of generic standard uh, major functions of the small intestine cells, the entero, enterocytes. Oh boy, I'm making a mess out of that E. Okay. Moving to slide six. Oops. All right, here's a villus. that's been colorized. Chances are, when we look at a microscope slide in, in class, um, you're not gonna see this. Uh, it certainly won't be colored this way. Um, but when it is colored this way, we can see, oh yeah, there, there's, there's stuff in the core of the villus, capillary bed and lacteal. When you look through a microscope in class, um, because it's really difficult to slice through the wall of the small intestine without also slicing through some of the villi, mm -hmm. you might see some distinct villi. It's possible, okay? But you'll also see these sort of islands intruding. You'd be like, what the hell is that? This is what happens when we slice through and we chop um, sort of at a, at a diagonal uh, through some villi. Okay, so, so don't get confused by those. Just find an ideal villus like this guy and focus on that. Uh, seven. There were four major types of uh, specialized cells in the stomach, there are five major types of specialized cells in the small intestine. And we could find all five of them in intestinal crypts, but some of them are um, located throughout the mucosa. Some of them are, are, are um, only found within crypts uh, then some of them are found almost, almost only, almost exclusively in crypts. So we'll establish that as we go along. Again, the sort of go-to, uh, get the major functions of the small intestine done cells for small intestine are the enterocytes. And we're going to see enterocytes on villi. We're going to see... Uh, enterocytes. I'm just gonna pause this and wait for my son to finish in the kitchen because he's being so loud. He's cute, but he's loud. Bye, sweetie. <laughs> in crypts, they're just about everywhere. Okay, and when um, enterocytes are 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 lining uh, or coating, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, a villus, their primary job is absorption, depending on where we are in the small intestine. So grain of salt there. But in crypts, enterocytes much more often are secreting. So when we talk about brush border enzymes, 
fresh porter enzymes are much more um, um, often made in crypts and then um, uh, will make their way to the lumen, whereas uh, fresh porter enzymes are, are a little less often made uh, right there at the, the surface of the lumen. Okay. And that juice that, that often enterocytes are, are producing um, will be relatively thin uh, with, with a bit of mucus, okay? And to be perfectly frank, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> Looks like a dangler. Uh, goblet cells, you're hopefully very familiar. We find those on villi and in crypts, okay? Enteroendocrine cells. Um, we saw enteroendocrine cells in the stomach as well. And um, they, in the stomach, were making serotonin, somatostatin, histamine, and gastrin. Whereas in the small intestine, they make a group of hormones that are called enterogastrones. And um, mostly what they do is influence the stomach. We've already started talking about them. They include gastrin. So there's intestinal gastrin. Secretin. And cholecystokinin and gastrin is stimulatory on the stomach whereas secretin and cholecystokinin are inhibitory on the stomach most of the enteroendocrine cells of the small intestine are um, sort of scattered here and there on the surface of villi but we will find some mostly in there too, um, in crypts. Uh, another type of specialized cell are the panath cells. And these guys are uh, pretty exclusively found in crypts. Okay, so nice and deep and buried in that, in that wall. And they are defensive. They're sort of like um, a specialized immune cell just for the small intestine. They prevent uh, pathogens from having easy access or gaining easy access to the circulatory system. And they do that by secreting antimicrobial agents like uh, defensins and lysozyme. Okay. Stem cells are also only found in crypts, deep, deep, deep. Okay. And they are mitotically active most of their daughter cells, well, really half of their daughter cells, will um, get pushed up and, and they'll sort of migrate up, up to the villus, most of them. Oops. There we go. Um, I guess I shouldn't say half. Uh, those daughter cells that are meant to replace stem cells will stay put. And those daughter cells that give rise or differentiate into panath cells, they're gonna stay put. Um, whereas any that differentiate into enteroendocrine cells may or may not uh, end up in the crypt. Goblet cells may or may not end up in the crypt. Enterocytes may or may not stay in the crypt. So um, it, it all depends on, on which cells we're talking about, okay? And because of this sort of um, migration upward, kind of like what we saw in the epidermis in 241. The um, cells that reach the, the apex of each villus, they're going to be the oldest, and we replace those um, about every three, four, or five days. Moving to slide eight, we've actually already seen slide eight, but now it's, it's um, more thoroughly labeled, okay? 
and I think that you'll be be uh, well. I think it would be nice nice if this were actually a little larger, but is green color coded green. Uh, guys, our enteroendocrine cells. Here are some panic cells. These guys are presumably these guys are stem cells. Okay. And then everything else, of course, is goblet cells and enterocytes. Uh, slide nine, we just finished looking at. Slide 10 lays out the position of liver, the hepatic duct, the cystic duct, the bile duct proper, okay? However, um, in the last slide of, I wanna say it was 23B, I uh, eliminated all the ducting for the pancreas. So we don't need to know, we don't need to be able to point these out or name them, okay? And we don't have to know duodenal papilla, this quarter, all right? But we do know, we do wanna know the, the shape of the pancreas and where it is. And remember the tail here sits just below the, well, uh, next to, we'll say, the, the spleen, it's touching the spleen. And here's the head, right? Again, hugged by the duodenum. And uh, almost all of the tube that we see here is duodenum, okay? 25-ish centimeters, 10-ish inch, inches. And then this little peekaboo here is the body of the gallbladder. Okay, not that we need to know it, but right here is where almost all of our pancreatic juice and um, bile uh, collectively together, in fact, um, get get dumped into the duodenum. Whereas here is where the duodenum has received chyme. And right about here is where duodenum is transitioning into junum. Jejunum, I just said junum. Jejunum. Moving on to slide 11. Recall that the wall of the small intestine is uh, embedded with malt, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. And throughout, we can find a thin, small uh, malt follicles, just individual, teeny tiny, sort of exposed. They're not like encapsulated or um, clumped together uh, lymphoid follicles. But along the distal end of the small intestine, so uh, closer to, to ileum, right, uh, we're going to see some some of these follicles uh, aggregate into Peyer's patches, Peyer's patches. But either way, either way, these are in place to ensure that that pathogens um, don't have access or don't successfully access our circulatory system, which is so close to the surface of the small intestine that it's sort of a dangerous place. Um, it's, a, it's certainly a place where pathogens would have access if we didn't have um, these mechanisms in place. Okay, and in the basement membrane um, of the, the small intestine, in the region of, of Peyer's patches, we're gonna find lots and lots of plasma cells that are specifically secreting immunoglobulin A, which uh, we expect to find in secretions. Okay. 
Now, as we move along the small intestine distally, we're going to see back bacteria. Um, uh, we're going to see it more and more often. We're going to see their numbers increasing as we get closer and closer to the large intestine. And so that's that's one of the chief reasons why this small intestine is sort of uh, in jeopardy. It's 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 one of the reasons why pathogens pathogens are likely to try to access the circulatory system across this wall because they're likely to be present. Whereas um, if we're in the proximal end of the small intestine, in other words, duodenum, the chyme is still so acidic that, that most bacteria are not going to thrive there. The submucosa of the small intestine uh, secretes an alkaline mucus, okay, especially um, proximally, so especially in the duodenum, to help neutralize that acidic chyme that's coming in. Slide 12, we, um, as you hopefully know, we add so much water to our foodstuffs we add water to our foodstuffs in the mouth in the form primarily of, of saliva. We add foodstuffs to, I'm sorry, water to our foodstuffs in uh, the, the stomach, primarily in the form of watery mucus. We uh, add water to our foodstuffs in the, in the small intestine. And in the small intestine alone, we secrete uh, one up to two liters of juice every day. Wow, that's a lot. And the major stimulus that, that tells us uh, when to secrete more, when to, to secrete not so much, is um, what the contents of the kind that, that we're receiving on the duodenal end uh, are if the the chyme that we're receiving is especially solute rich and or especially acidic, then we're more likely to make um, a lot of intestinal juice in response. And that intestinal juice is slightly alkaline again to to balance out um, that acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach and uh, is isotonic with blood plasma, meaning that um, it doesn't have the same solutes necessarily, but it has the same amount or concentration of solutes, which makes absorption um, much more so uh, facilitated, much more so uh, possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Lots of water in intestinal juice, okay, but also some mucus. Right? And we already know that mucus can act as a protectant and a lubricant, so we like mucus. Moving on to 13. So when chyme arrives in the duodenum, it will contain partially digested carbs. It will contain partially digested proteins, okay? But lipids, are barely digested, just barely. The small intestine will actually take usually more, so usually on the end of, of, of six, seven, eight hours. Um, to absorb almost all of the water from our foodstuffs, including, yes, much of the water that the small intestine itself has put into the foodstuffs, and almost all of the nutrients from our, from our foodstuffs. The enzymes necessary for digestion are supplied uh, in bile, 
bicarbonate, which um, is included in pancreatic juice. Okay. Digestive enzymes, which primarily are in pancreatic juice. But um, collectively, these are the products of liver and pancreas. Liver and pancreas. And then the other source of enzymes, uh, of course, are the simple columnar um, cells of the, the small intestine mucosa themselves um, that are secreting brush border enzymes, right? And I remember chyme is at least conventionally, locally, uh, spelled with a Y. Moving on to slide 14. The um, small intestine wants to um, bring solute-rich foodstuffs into a more isotonic um, condition. Uh, the, the, the solute concentration should better match that of our bloodstream. So the small intestine is, uh, it's important that it not be overwhelmed with chyme, that it, that it just work, be able to work on a little chyme at a time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the delivery of chyme is, is quite slow and rather spurty, sorry. That's kind of gross. Uh, so the, the pylorus of the stomach is, is squirting really small amounts of chyme into the duodenum uh, at a time and is, uh, is, is doing so mostly in response to intestinal uh, gastrin. So it's not like it's, it's squirting uh, necessarily in a, in a regular um, rhythm. Right, the, the intestine can say, whoa, slow down. And if the intestine does say slow down, then it's going to do so primarily with secretin and cholecystokinin. So uh, we need to adjust the pH. That's one of the reasons why we want to work on just a little bit of a chyme, of chyme at, at a time. Uh, we have to mix chyme with other stuff, pancreatic juice and bile and brush border enzymes for that matter. Uh, so, so again, we want this. We want this release to be slow. We want just small, um, small servings, if you will, of chyme at at, at one moment to the next. And so, um, who's going to be regulating that? The enterogastrons, um, intestinal gastrin, secretin, and cholecystokinin. Moving on to slide fifteen. So uh, immediately after a meal, our small intestine is primarily practicing segmentation, the contraction of non-adjacent segments along really a muscular tube, in this case, the small intestine. And remember that segmentation promotes mixing. even more so than, than propulsion. And segmentation is initiated by the enteric nervous system. So the, the pacemaker cells that are intrinsic to the gut, uh, not the, the more um, large scale nervous system. And ultimately we're trying to move foodstuffs toward the ileocecal valve, the junction between ileum and large intestine. We regulate segmentation via primarily hormones and nervous system. Well, I should really say nervous systems. So that's what, what reflex is, is referring to. We should already know that our parasympathetic nervous pathway promotes promotes digestive activity and our sympathetic nervous pathway inhibits digestive activity. Whereas 
when we're in the fasting state, when we're between meals, uh, the, the small intestine is is not primarily doing segmentation. It's primarily doing peristalsis, and peristalsis is much more so about propulsion. Propulsion. There, I got it. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get uh, as much of of the foodstuffs um, that remain to that ileocecal valve. We're also trying to sort of flush out bacteria from the distal um, small intestine. Uh, any anything that couldn't be digested, we want to. We just want to move it all through. We want to. We want to flush everything out, and so that's what the peristalsis is is primarily doing. And remember, the peristalsis is uh, wave like contraction. And uh, it is seen in adjacent segments, whereas segmentation is non-adjacent segments, okay? And if we're going to um, sort of watch the foodstuffs moving from duodenum to ileum, quite frankly, this is a gross understatement. It is, it's usually more like six or more hours. Moving to slide 16, the ileocecal valve is uh, uh, equipped with a sphincter, okay? And when that sphincter relaxes, the foodstuffs, the chyme-ish stuff inside the large, in, uh, sorry, small intestine, is allowed to um, access the lumen of the large intestine, okay? And uh, we primarily get that done via um, force, force of segmentation, and for that matter, force of peristalsis as well. Uh, the force applied in the ileum is going to be most most relevant because it's closest to the large intestine, okay? Uh, gastrin not only promotes stomach activity, but also promotes the motility of the ileum, and therefore has a, a big influence on the force that we're applying to foodstuffs. The ileocecal valve will close when chyme sort of bounces uh, back, back onto the ileocecal valve. So very much like um, blood in the aorta that has lost momentum falling and closing the cusps, the flaps of the aortic valve. Very, very, very similar, okay? And this prevents any backflow, right? We don't want things moving in the wrong direction, okay? Ultimately, we want to we want to sweep out the stomach. We want to sweep out the small intestine so that we're ready for the next meal, okay?